everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Don Toothaker is a director of photo adventures for Hans Photo and Video. That means he leads photographic workshops all over the world. Cuba, Tanzania, Alaska, Italy, Bosque de la Pache, you name it, he's been there. His motto, Photograph What You Feel, is his guiding mantra, and it's a mantra it took him some years to grow into. Please welcome Don Toothaker to Bump in the Road. Don, tell us a little bit about where you are right now and uh, what the place means to you. Well, uh, good morning from uh, Toothacres Acres in Solon, <laughs> Maine, which is a little tiny town in the central part of the state. Um, as you maybe you can catch a little bit of a glimpse from behind me, it's just a log cabin that my family built uh, 30 something years ago on a big chunk of land that's nothing but a tangled mess of trees and woods and forest and um and critters. And, uh, this is my favorite place in the world and, uh, it's mine now. And I come here as much as I can, um, for a variety of reasons. I enjoy the work that I do here. Um, but it's also the place where my photography began in earnest. Uh, I'd owned a camera for a little while. I was very happy documenting my life on program mode and, and, uh, being curious when I had good results and not understanding why I had bad results. And it was my curiosity about nature that made me go into the woods here and want to photograph lady slippers or deer or moose or birds or whatever. And it just, and I, it was here that I started to say, I want to do this on purpose. I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to get something and not understand why it came out well or didn't. And it was where I, I'm a self-taught photographer completely. And this was the most pivotal place for my learning and my frustrations and my failures and my occasional cursing and wanting to take up uh, golf as a hobby instead. But uh, I stuck with it and uh, I still come here and I'm still amazed and I still learn and I'm still motivated and inspired by everything that's in the natural world here, including the people. Um, it's everything to me. So uh, I'm really, really happy to be here to talk to you this morning because this is. Uh, this is like the epicenter of uh, what I do and who I am and what I do. How far are you from the water? Well, we're right smack in the middle of the state. So I'm not near the ocean. I'm about a two hour drive from the ocean. And uh, I have 64 acres of woods here and there's a stream and there's a, a pond courtesy of some beavers now. Um, but I'm really close to a major river, Kennebec River, which is only about three miles away and several ponds. Uh, and lakes, which provide me with an, uh, an abundance of opportunity for, you know, shooting water, shooting over water, you know, wildlife on water, kayaking, um, waterfall streams. It's it's all right here, and it's uh, it's nice. I wish it was. I wish the ocean was a little closer, but I'll I'll take what I got. How would you describe your photography? Um, is it landscape oriented, people oriented, and how has it evolved over time? That's a that's a, that's a great question because that's something I incorporate into my teaching. I, I don't really like I don't like to say like ever I'm a, a photography teacher. I kind of regard myself as a photography coach. So I say that I coach people. Um, in my coaching, I, I constantly tell people. The world is like way too big and way too interesting and way too beautiful and way too full of amazing things to ever limit yourself. And why would you want to do that anyways? You know, um, so I'm an advocate for being the best photographer you can be in all things. Now, in that, there'll always be something that fits a little bit better than something else. Um but I think we have the responsibility as photographers to do the best we can at everything. If I you know, from a practical standpoint, if somebody calls me up and says, hey, Don, we want to pay you to do some architectural photography. Uh, or, hey, Don, can you do some corporate headshots at a local bank? I want to be able to do those and I want to be able to do those as well as I can with the, you know, with whatever resources I have and my creativity. 
but the reality for me, like, you know, the, the basis of what I do is, is nature. I mean, I love the outdoors. I love wildlife. I love landscapes. I love scenics. Um, so that's where it all began for me. I, I, I grew up in a, you know, hunting and fishing and camping and it's it just being outdoors. You know, my mother threw us outside the minute you had your breakfast and she didn't let you back in until it was dinner time. So you just were always outside. And, um, and of course my parents would always take, you know, vacations to Maine and I was just mesmerized by the woods and these big animals that could be in the woods, you know? So it's, that's where it started for me, but over time now it's, um, I hate to use the word growing up because, you know, I really don't really want to grow up. But um, as I travel, I realize that I need people. I think people are an essential part of my personality. Um, and now my photography, I recognize that I need people in my photography. I need socializing. I need interaction. And uh, I just wrote a blog. I wrote a blog last week that was, you know, people made some funny comments. But when I look in the mirror, I see a plain bagel and the world is full of so many other awesome, different color, different flavor, different textured bagels. And I want to see them all. I, I think a box of plain bagels is pretty drab and pretty boring. So um, I love when I travel and, and, you know, whether I take a group of people to Tanzania, I still want to go to tribes and, and see people because Africa is about more than just wildlife. When I go to Cuba or the essential story is the, the human component. I'm in Maine. I'm, I'm going to do a nature photography workshop this weekend, but we're going to go some places where we're going to encounter people and I'm going to encourage people to, or encourage the photographers to engage with people. And, uh, I think there were, I think people are a critical element of your photographic story, which was what I'm always trying to tell people to work on. Don't wait for, you know, don't go out looking for or waiting for some singular iconic photo be a photojournalist and tell the most thorough story of your experience. And then hopefully somewhere in that is that one iconic photo that stands out for you more than some of the others. And people are a part of every, every story and journey. Now you, you, no matter where you go at every corner of the world, there is the influence of people one way or another. Was there a turning point in your photography um, in terms of how you, you look at all this? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, I've had several different moments. Um, I think, you know, part of just growing up and, and maturing and uh, developing your eye and your interest. I think I'm just very curious about, I'm a homebody by nature, but I'm curious about the world. So every new experience shapes me. And, you know, the first time I went to Cuba, I was like everyone else, you know, like, wow, urban decay in cars. And then, you know, by the second or third trip, I didn't want any of that. I just wanted the people because things had evolved. Um, but probably the two, you know, the three most pivotal things were, you know, starting my own workshop company in 2009 with my good friend, Bob Ring, who, um, we spent nine years together determined to be the experts on new England. Um, as far as photo, you know, photography and photography instruction. And, and I think we did a pretty good job at that. We worked really, really hard. We were a great team. We complimented each other well. We were great friends. We had great respect for each other. And sadly, Bob passed away uh, a year ago. And uh, prior to his passing away, you know, his health had diminished enough that we sat down, had a long conversation about our future as a as a team. And on, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, you know, I'm I'm 55. Bob would be 71. Uh, right now. And uh, he was, he had reached a point in his life where he should be spending more time traveling with his wife instead of bumming around in hotels with me taking pictures. So that was when the door opened for me to take a full-time position at Hunt's Photo and Video in Massachusetts as the director of their photography uh, workshops. Uh, but when Bob passed away, I just became, like I said, we were a great team. You know, we were a yin and yang. I was all about the emotion of photography and he was an engineer. So it was always about the structure of photography and the technical aspects. And we, we blended those things together really well. Our personalities were similar enough that we complimented each other. We liked all the same things, but we, we didn't like them for the same reasons necessarily. And we didn't photograph them for the same reasons. And I think I have more than ever picked up that baton since, this, uh, since we, we stopped doing 
workshops together. And then a year ago with his passing, I've just become more determined, you know, to represent him as well as I can, you know, uh, he's, he, he was an awesome guy. He was funny. He was fun. He was about as faithful and loyal and good as a friend as you'd ever want to meet. And I'm proud to say it was my friend and I was his friend. And, and what we did for nine years was unbelievable. And I just take some of that. And now I'm in, I'm hoping I'm influencing, you know, what I'm doing at Hunt's Photo in the same manner, the same integrity about what we do and how we go about it and why we do it. And uh, so Bob's with me every day and uh, I miss him, but he's with me every day. Bob left behind a very large body of work, didn't he? He did. He did. What happened to it? Still undetermined. Um, and this is a great lesson for all of us photographers. And it's hard to talk about, so please bear with me. Um, I don't know the exact count. Bob had been photographing for many, many years, and he was a very good, very competent, very diligent, very active photographer who loved landscapes. And, uh, oh, I think he probably had somewhere in the vicinity of 15 terabytes of images with nowhere to go with them. And... I think his his uh, his wife Judy and his son Stephen, um, they have done a very good job culling out things that were extra meaningful to them. Family photos, family trips, certain photos that Bob did that that maybe perhaps drew more attention and accolades and others. And I think I know that it's been a very laborious and emotional process of culling those images out. And I don't. I, 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 I it, it breaks my heart to think of what they had to go through to get rid of things because it was Bob, you know, by deleting something, you're, you're deleting a part of this person who was everything in your life. And we all need to think about that as photographers. What, what happens to our stuff? What happens to our gear? What happens to our, our efforts and, and all these things that we pour our heart and soul into what happens when we're, when we leave this earth, because we're all going to leave this earth. And I think every photographer needs to listen to that and organize yourself so that it's, you know, Bob was the most disorganized, organized person I'd ever met in my life. So when I helped his wife, Judy, go through his equipment when he had passed and, you know, we, we took some time and waited, Bob kept everything and he kept great records of it and he even kept it in pretty good order. But even then, it was still incredibly daunting. The emotional part, plus the logistical part of just sorting it out. I can't imagine somebody who was disorganized, how you would find anything or get into computers and organize. Bob was, he was an engineer, so everything was organized. From that moment, when I finished helping Judy, I invested a tremendous amount of my own time organizing my stuff. I mean, anything could happen on any given day. I mean, it almost happened to me a couple of years ago. My life almost changed uh, drastically for the worst a few years ago. And we take it for granted that that isn't going to happen. It will never happen again. But the reality is it's going to happen at some point And we need to prepare ourselves for it, not only for ourselves, but for those who come after us. And um, I would love to think that my photography would make some difference in the world. But the reality is, I just have to hope it makes a difference in my family's world and anything after that is an extra bonus. Um, but we need to prepare ourselves for that. It's a, it's a horrible thing to think about and it was a horrible thing to witness, but it was a very, very wonderfully poignant reminder. And uh, I didn't envy Judy and Steven at all. And I still don't cause there's still more work to do, but they have inspired me to get my affairs in order as much as I can. Cause you never know. Photography transcends time. It's one of the things I find fascinating about it. Um, what would you want your photography to say to somebody? Oh, wow. I don't know if we have enough time for that. <laughs> um, well, the first thing I'd wanted to say that I was here. I was here. And I do my best to not look at the world. I want to be part of it. And I want my somehow I want my photos to 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 carry that weight, that feeling, that emotion. And because I'm in astonishment of all of it, I'm in awe of all of it, whether it's a humble little log cabin in the woods or, you know, uh, 
looking out over the Serengeti, the, the feeling for me is ultimately the exact same, that I'm in awe of the enormity and the diversity and the uniqueness and the beauty and the not so beautiful globe world. It, it's, it's really unbelievable. So I just wanted to be a record that I was here and I saw it and I, and I felt it. I didn't check it off my list. Like Ben here done that. Don't need to do that again. Um, I want my family to, to look at what I do and say, wow, you saw that. And you, you were, you were right there. You were in it. Um, which is one of the reasons why I even write about some of the stuff I do, because part of my inspiration to write is that legacy. I mean, maybe it's a small legacy. Maybe it's just for my, my children, but it's a legacy nonetheless. And, and if I do, when I do leave this earth, I want them to be able to somehow have an affinity or a feeling for what I did and where I went and who I saw and what I saw and what it meant to me. I do my very best to express it. You um, hurt your back a few years ago, right? I did. I did. Did, did that change your, your perspective on things a bit? Absolutely. Um, I'm 55 years old now. Um, I still play ice hockey. It's my favorite sport in the world. Um, I love its energy. I love its speed. I love its finesse. I love its violence. Um, I love its chaos. And I love... The camaraderie that comes from all those things being there's no there's no team or locker room like a hockey team or a hockey locker room, and uh, so that's you know I love it to go just blow steam off, and uh, coming up on three years ago, I crashed headfirst into the boards after being tripped, and uh, the subsequent result was I broke my neck and I crushed the T6 and T7 vertebrae in my spine. And, um, according to my awesome, uh, uh, doctor and neurosurgeon, um, I came within about a 16th inch of my life being very, very, very different. I didn't suffer any compound fractures or fractures. Everything just crushed like a beer can. And, um, it was her horrific accident. Um, I went home and spent the next, it was on December, I got to think December 16th, just before Christmas. And um, I spent the next couple of weeks sitting in a chair, sleeping in a chair, propped up, terrified that if I sneezed, you know, was my neck going to snap and change everything in my life? Because that's some of the feedback I was getting. Uh, I actually went and did a workshop in, in January down in uh, Florida and carried around my big, heavy Nikon equipment and big lenses. And I was in excruciating pain, but I, it's my job. I felt like I needed to do it. Um, and I came home from that and uh, I, I, I knew that there's no way I could never not do what I do. So I had to change everything about the way I did it. I had to, change, I had to downsize all my gear, which I was happy to do. That was no big deal. But it made me very, like, I, I remember going out uh, by myself. I took a drive uh, just before Christmas. I went down to the common, in the town that I live in, and I wanted to just photograph the town common Christmas tree on the, on the town common. And I sat there and cried because I didn't know if I was ever going to get to do it again. And uh, right at that moment, I said, you know, I'm never going to take this for granted ever again. I'm never going to, you know, I, I – I still, you know, I'm built for work, if you will say. Uh, I'm pretty sturdy. Um, I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid of hard work. I'm not afraid of pushing the limits of my body sometimes, but I'm never going to take it for granted ever again. And I think from that came the spectacular, I don't know, enlightenment that I could do more. I needed to do more. I wasn't going to settle for documenting things. And, and even even in my efforts to go deeper in my photography personally and help other people get pers I, I still felt I had to go more. I had to go deeper. It had to have, I had to find something that resonated far deeper than just a job. And I had to, I had to embrace the fact, you know, I think everyone in the world has been given some talent, 
a God-given talent. And I think we're all responsible in some way, shape, or form to get it out there and share it and do something productive and good with it. And, you know, you know, I, I can't build a house. I can't, I can't, uh, you know, I'm not going to be a chef. I'm not going to be a neuroscientist. I'm not going to, there's a lot of things. I'm not going to fix and cure cancer, but I can help people learn how to take a pretty good photo. And more importantly, I'm very open and willing to having great conversations with them about why they want to do it. And I can help them dig deeper into the why they do photography. Everyone likes to talk about how, how many megapixels, what camera, what Apple computer you have, what software you're using, and all that stuff's well and good, and it's great. They're all amazing tools and resources. But I like to drill into people and figure out, you know, and remind them, you're the greatest resource. Why are you doing this? And please don't, please don't glaze over your answer with a shallow end of the pool. You know, I retired and I need a hobby or I've got, you know, extra time on my hands. Let's, let's really talk about it because that's what happened for me when I broke my neck. And I, and I really thought there's a good chance I'm never going to get to do this again, at least in the capacity that I was doing it. And I had to answer those things for myself that the second time in my life, the first time, you know, when I, when I had to take a look at photography was, you know, I, I got married, I bought a house and all my hobbies had to go away, golf and going away for, on the weekends with the guys and all these extra things that I was doing. And that's when I had to really look at my camera and say, well, I, I, I can't give this up. So if I'm going to keep it, I have to commit myself to keeping it with a greater purpose. Like instead of just snapshots and taking pictures, I wanted to learn more about creating images that had more meaning in my life. But then the second time was okay. Like I had this horrible accident that could have changed things and thankfully didn't, but I had to, I had to dig deep. And, and, and I'm, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I think, you know, I, I've, as a young man, as a kid, I think there's a lot of my teachers and my sisters and some friends that would probably tell you the same thing. I made a lot of noise, but I didn't say much. And now I'm not content being silent. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you, you have no, you have no, I admire kids that have courage and are willing to go against the grain and, and be different and embrace being different. Cause I wasn't, I was like a mainstream trout, just wanted to swim in the middle of the pack and don't let, don't pay any attention to me. And it's not that I'm seeking attention now. It's just that I refuse to be silent. That's why I write and I post things on Instagram and Facebook because I have something to say because it all means so much to me. And I'm more committed to that than ever. And, uh, and now even when I take people out, you know, we're going to start a workshop tomorrow and, uh, I'm sure everybody that's coming is, is expecting, let's go to this big, grand, amazing scene on day one and let's get really invigorated. We're not, we're going to go to the most mundane, fairly boring place. And we're going to spend three hours there. And I'm going to tell them they cannot leave until they make five compelling images that tells me how they feel about where we're at because that is what it's all about why do we do this we do this because we're trying to share our feelings we're, that's why my my you know i say it in my writings and it's the thesis of my coaching and the thesis of my photography is photograph what you feel none of us are trying to take a picture of something at least in my opinion the the reality is we're all trying to take a picture or capture an image of how we feel about something. And we, we, we give ourselves all these tools and these resources and these destinations and these, these objectives and these reasons to go do those things. And what we got to do more than anything is have a conversation with ourselves about why we're doing it. What does it mean to us? Um, I think the tough part is to tap into that transcendent emotion that everybody gets. I mean, I can take a picture and it means something to me, perhaps, but it may not mean anything to anybody else. How do you bring that together so that you evoke emotion through your photography in others? That's the, that's the greatest challenge right there. You just, you just summed it up. That's the greatest challenge. You can teach anybody how to press the buttons on a camera and set menus. It's the buttons in your heart and your soul and your, what you, how you feel about what you see. That I, I can't program those for you. So what I need to do is talk to you about it, have you be honest with me 
you know, and, and share it with me. And, and, you know, not every, you know, not every photo that we create is going to resonate, you know, like, you know, Ansel Adams moonrise over New Mexico. It's, it's, but each one of those images has to resonate with us first. It can't resonate necessarily with someone else until it resonates with you. So I think what I tell people all the time is, is, you know, try to avoid the pitfalls of competition. Camera clubs. I love camera clubs. Camera clubs are a phenomenal thing. So the, the, you know, my cabin here was the greatest catalyst uh, of my photography, but a camera club and being around other like-minded people was my, my, was my engine. The only downside to a camera club is the competitive nature. Everything has to be quantified. This won, but that didn't win. Why did this one win? But why didn't that one win? And I think there just needs to be more discussion about how people feel about those things. So I try to tell people to, you know, avoid the pitfalls of competition and even myself, avoid the pitfalls of Facebook and Instagram and other social media. Like, gee, how many likes did I get? People like that. Did people not like that? Why did they like it? It's very hard not to be influenced those things, influenced by those things. The root of it all is just making yourself happy. And I love when I'm out with somebody and we're working on something together and they say to me, I love this one. There you go. Problem solved. You, you love it. And I'm going to love it because you're telling me why you loved it. And the bonus, I tell people all the time, to do something that you love. If someone else comes along and loves it as well or equally or has some thought or feeling, that's a bonus. The success is your own feeling. The bonus is other people uh, enjoying it. Now, I personally think the greatest thing that can happen from our photography is that we instill or provoke some sort of response. Now, it's not always the response that we want or expected, uh, but it's a response nonetheless. And if you can elicit a response from somebody, you were successful because they they looked at it and they thought about it. It's the photos that, you know, unfortunately, this generation where we just swipe on our phones, pass this one, pass this one, pass this one, pass, oops, stop on that one, like it, you know, move on. You know, the idea is to to evoke a response. And, and in order to do so, it's not how many megapixels your camera has or if you use a certain particular processing, you know, software or what lens you used. It's really about how much of you you could put into that photo to get the best of me to respond to it. It's a challenge. And I love the challenge. I think it's awesome. I love it. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.